Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church in Vernon and online and in your living rooms wherever you are. I'm here in our sanctuary where the rest of you are not, which is a tough thing, but it's a good thing as we seek to care for our community and uh, pray for our world in this time. But as we always do, we meet together to worship. Let me read from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And we've been talking lots about how we are his temple and that he fills the earth with his presence. So wherever we are, we are in his courts. So enter them with praise this morning. We've pre-recorded much of this uh, service just to try to make this work seamlessly. So hopefully it does, and you can enter in. Blessings. Here, and we invite you into our living room and into the presence of God. And we ask God's presence to fill uh, each of our living rooms or studies or offices, wherever we're meeting. And... Uh, and we're going to worship together as the people of First Baptist Church, Vernon. So we've got some songs prepped. Uh, and Hannah's chosen some, some beautiful songs for us to sing together today. And it might feel a little funny for you to sing right where you are, but we ask that you enter in with your hearts. And if that's just listening, great. If that's singing out loud, if that's opening your window so your neighbor hears... That's great. Uh, however you're going to do it this morning. I know that Lori has a great word for us from God's word from Acts as we continue our story there. And we're going to spend some moments in prayer and we want to lift up our hearts to God. So let's pray together and then we'll enter into this time of sun worship. Heavenly Father, in this time of of a crisis in our world we pause and we gather as your people we gather as your temple here on earth spread out wherever we are now we love to come together on a sunday morning and we don't get to do that today but we come together in spirit in your spirit and we still worship you for you are our great high and mighty God, and we lift up your name this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we want to read together from Isaiah chapter 40. If you have your Bible there, you can turn to Isaiah 40 and read along with us in your own language. I'm going to start at verse 28, and we're going to read through verses 31. Do you not know... Have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's sing.
let's continue with the song we've been learning and loving in our congregation. We'll remind ourselves who we are in Christ, even now, stuck at home, afraid or anxious. We're not forsaken. And, and God is for us, not against us. do, I'm going to read to us from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be apparent to all. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Think on these things. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's our hope. What we need is just to trust in our God of peace, in our Lord. 
but we'll sing Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. might be new. We've been playing it on our church website for this past week though and maybe you've heard it. It's called He Will Hold Me Fast. Randy, do you want to tell your story about what hold me fast means? Sure, yeah. We were doing this song with our youth on our Monday morning Bible study before church I and mean before school and uh, I asked uh, some of the kids if they know what fast meant, hold me fast. And uh, for them, fast, of course, would mean that you do something quickly. You hold you quickly. And we had to explain the terminology of being on a ship and going through a storm and having, having yourself held fast by ropes, by straps, that when you're going through, even on a ship in a storm, that you'll be held fast. The ship is held together and you are held to it. That the word steadfast, Fasten. And that's that's what we're singing about, is that he's going to hold us securely through whatever storm comes our way, even in this time when we have to be apart from each other.
Yes, Lord. We want this to be true. We want to say this over and over again to remind ourselves and pray that it would sink into our hearts and our spirits, that we would know that all is well and all will be well in your truth and in your good and perfect way. So we trust you, Lord. We, we want you to speak to our hearts every moment this morning while we're together, but on the days when we're not. And um, let us know your goodness in new ways and old ways through this time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that great to worship together? Even if it's a little bit different than we usually do. I trust that you were able to enter into a certain degree as we worshipped. I wanted to pause and we're uh, out here on the river getting a little bit of fresh air. I wanted to pause and pray together. I thought it might be nice to do that from out here and bring this beautiful river into your home today. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray a couple passages of scripture. And before I do, I wanted to read from Martin Luther, who had an incredible quote as they were dealing with the crisis in his day as well. And I think this is really important. He says this, showing some balance between uh, w being wise and cautious and loving. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith, because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. He shows us that wisdom. So let's pray, uh, pray for the needs in our community. There's definitely some needs that have come up. Noreen Williams, Chuck's mother, is in hospital. She fell and broke her hip and isn't doing that well. So we need to pray for her. We need to pray for Chuck and the Street Church Ministry and the Upper Room Mission as they seek to reach out to those neediest among us, how they can do that. Eva Kettle is back in, in Polson back in her room so we can continue to pray for her healing and there are others amidst us of course that are not feeling well and uh, and so we need to pray for them and then there are those of us that are quite um, quite anxious about all this and it's not easy so let's pray for each other in that light as well this is from Psalm 25 in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Lord, we do pray uh, we pray for those in our community that are not doing well, that are struggling, fighting against sickness, against broken bones, against cancer, and wondering if uh, help will come their way in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, will things get worse or will they get better? God, we ask that you would, you would provide, be their healing, be their wholeness, 
in the midst of this uncertain time. And God, we pray for each of us as we struggle either with uh, anxiety or with denial. God, we pray that we would be wise and yet loving, uh, cautious and yet courageous. Show us how to, how to follow you through this time, over these next days and weeks and perhaps months. God, help us not to spread this disease, but to stand up against it. God, we ask that you, that you would move among us as your people guiding us, that we'd be able to trust you and know by your empowering presence, your Holy Spirit in us, how to act and live and move and have our being. And we pray this prayer for a global pandemic. O oh, healer of all creation, we come to lay our fears and confusion at the foot of thy throne. As the coronavirus spreads, shine thy light perpetual on those who have died and be a stronghold for those at risk. Give supernatural endurance, ingenious and dexterity to all public health officials and hospital personnel. Give public servants wisdom for the tough decisions they now must make. Redeem our lost time, resources, and plans, and provide for those who cannot afford these disruptions. And turn this chaos into order for the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, for your glory, who reigns with our Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. And we're... Uh, we're going to go, I think, to the church, and we're going to hear from Lori as he gives us the Word of God. Well, it's my privilege to invite Lori to preach the Word today, and so I'm going to pray for him as he delivers God's message for us. So let's pray for our brother. Heavenly Father, I do pray for Lori, and I ask your blessing on him. Thank you for the words that he's prepared, the words that you've given him for us at this time as we journey through this book. And so I ask that you would open our hearts to what you would have us to receive in this time of need, that your word would have its way in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, and good morning, everyone. This morning we're going to be looking at chapter 9 of Acts, starting at verse 19 and going to verse 31. So if you want to grab your Bibles and have them out there and open, that would be great. But I'm going to start off by asking you a question first. How many of you have ever taken a dare? How many of you, when dared to do something funny or adventurous or even dangerous, have jumped in with both feet and done it. Can I have a show of hands? Only the cameraman, apparently. Anyway, you remember when you were a kid, especially when you were dared, you didn't dare not do it because then you'd be called a sissy or a coward, right? So daring is, well, something that we dare to do. This morning we are daring to do something we've never done before. Circumstances surrounding the COVID-19 crisis have dared us to continue to gather for worship. And we have done it. We come to you, into your homes, through the wonders of technology, so that we can worship together while maintaining a safe distance or even self-isolating. I like dares once in a while. They, they keep us on our toes and they push us out of our comfort zone. When we dare, challenges become opportunities, and we can reach new levels of service and ministry. As one dear pastor friend, Dan Colborn, put it, challenging times are times of significance. This challenging time is an opportunity for the church to be truly significant in our world. 
another pastor of another church in town spotted something online and dared me to get it and wear it the next time I preached. And here it is. I don't know if you can read it or not, but it says, it's a lorry thing. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> so here it is. This is my dare for the day. Here it is, Gary, if you're watching. <laughs> so you know that I actually did it. Now, today's scripture passage opens with Saul still in Damascus. And then suddenly he's in Jerusalem. From other writings, we know that Luke's gift a bit of history here. We have to understand that writers of the Gospels were not always really interested in chronological sequences. They were more interested in getting the Gospel message out there in a way that the readers could easily understand. That's why some people get caught up in seeing contradictions and inconsistencies and so forth when comparing the various books. And in fact, in Acts, Luke doesn't refer to Saul as Paul until the 13th chapter, but that doesn't mean he wasn't called Paul before that. So as we go along here, we'll be going back and forth between Saul and Paul as I cite some of his letters. And the first letter we're gonna look at is Galatians. Almost immediately after his conversion, he set out for Arabia. That's chapter one, verse 15. He tells us, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. This probably fits somewhere between verses 19, 20, 22, 23 in Luke's account, somewhere in there. But Saul spent time in Arabia. He went off to be alone, and then he went back to Damascus. What did he do in Arabia? How long was he there? Paul doesn't say. But it was likely a time of intense introspection, of connecting prayerfully with God, of rethinking his whole faith and life. After all, his whole life was centered around the Jewish religion. It was what he lived for, nothing else. In Philippians 3, verse 5 and 6, he described himself as circumstanced on the, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. One obvious question he might have asked himself was, have I been wrong all my life? How many of us have asked that question at some point in our lives? How many have asked it even recently? I remember an engineering student we had working at the city one summer. She had an interesting name, which I misheard when I was first introduced to her. So I called her the wrong name all summer and did not find out until she was gone what her real name was. I was wrong that whole summer. Thankfully, she was such a wonderful person that she never said anything. But embarrassed and confused, or what? Or probably nowhere near as confused as Saul was feeling at that time. We don't know how long he was in Arabia, but then he returned to Damascus. It was three years before he finally returned or headed to Jerusalem. He explains this in Galatians chapter one, verses 18 to 20. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. So what happened when he went to Jerusalem? Luke says the apostles were afraid of him. Barnabas was the one who convinced them to accept him. Maybe it was Barnabas who took him to where Cephas or Peter was staying. So who was this Barnabas? He's only mentioned a few times in the New Testament, but it's evident that he was important to the new church. We want to get a picture of who this man was. 
as he helped to change and direct the history of the church. He was born in Cyprus, named Joseph by his parents, a Levite by training. One of the earliest converts to Christianity, he quickly showed that he had wise discernment based in his true humility, his deep faith, and great courage. The first time we hear of him in the fourth chapter of Acts, verse 36 to 37, we are told that he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. From this earliest time, the apostles called him not Joseph, but Barnabas, which means son of encouragement or consolation. Some scholars even think that his name might even mean prophet or son of the prophet. But whatever it means, it was obvious that he was a calm and persistent force in keeping the church going forward, strong and faithful. In modern times, we would say this is a guy who thought outside the box. He saw beyond the limited vision of others, though it appears he was neither pushy nor ambitious. In chapter 11, verses 22 to 24, we see how much the early church appreciated Barnabas' qualities. When the church leaders heard of the great work that was being done among the Gentiles, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was, in, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. He was the one who was sent to make sure the ministry to the Gentiles didn't falter. And realizing he needed help, he went and fetched Saul from Tarsus. But, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's go back to when Saul first came to Jerusalem. From Damascus. He didn't get a cheery welcome, as we see in verse 26. He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. The primary response to Saul's presence in the city was fear. Their first reaction was distrust. And who could blame them? Saul had a fearsome reputation going back to the stoning of Stephen, which, when he heard Stephen's testimony about Jesus, probably emboldened him to start persecuting the church. He was a one-man wrecking ball, a murderous, ferocious defender of the Jewish faith, a Pharisee of Pharisees, mercilessly seeking out and killing members of the fledgling church. How could he change, the apostles asked themselves. How could they know if his so-called conversion was genuine? You know, it's like the COVID-19 virus had just arrived in town, in Vernon here, and the person who may be carrying it wanted to get all chummy and lovey-dovey with us and hugging and kissing and all that gooey stuff. Yeah, we'd be afraid too. In Barnabas' day, a holy kiss was not out of order between the apostles who were greeting each other. In fact, it was a Jewish tradition. When Jesus was dining at the home of the Pharisee, he admonished his host for not kissing him in greeting, while the woman washing his feet never stopped kissing him. In at least four of his letters, Paul himself encouraged the believers to greet one another with a holy kiss. Even Peter encouraged that. And of course, they all would have remembered who it was who kissed Jesus on the day, he, the night he was arrested. Perhaps they saw Saul as a Judas in reverse, infiltrating their ranks to betray them, afraid that at the first kiss, soldiers would be burst through, bursting through the doors and hauling them away. So what's with Barnabas? Why does he not fear Saul? Well, it's possible he knew Saul before. As a Levite, he would have had training in scriptures and traditions in the Jewish faith, possibly in the school of Gamaliel, the same school that Paul attended, or Saul attended. So he might, they might even have been school champs, who knows? Or he might have encountered Saul during the time between his conversion and his trip to Jerusalem. It's possible, and maybe even likely, that 
when Barnabas heard the stories coming out of Damascus about Saul's supposed conversion. He went up there to check them out. Given what we hear him say in verse 27, how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he, he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. It almost sounds as if he was an eyewitness to Saul's preaching in Damascus. Or maybe he connected with him in Arabia. Curious about this man who suddenly left his avowed mission to destroy the church and fled to the desert. However it happened, it seems that Barnabas was fearless in his desire to know the truth about Saul. Now neither Luke nor Paul said anything about it in their writings. It apparently wasn't important to them. What Luke's reports as important is that Barnabas assured the apostles that Saul's conversion was genuine. In the midst of the fear shown by the rest of the leadership, Barnabas believed. As Luke had described him before in Acts 11, he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. While the rest were fearful and mistrusting, Barnabas was calm and sure, obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit. And once he actually described to the apostles what had happened to Saul, they were finally convinced and accepted him to begin ministry in Jerusalem. So what do we learn from this man, Barnabas? Even though he seems to be a perfect disciple, he wasn't perfect. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, we hear how Barnabas was led astray by Peter when it came to treating the Gentiles. And later, he argued with Paul about taking his cousin John Mark on ministry trips, missionary trips. So we know he was fully human. He had human faults. But despite that, Barnabas was someone who helped not only to spread the gospel and expand the church, but who helped to keep it together, to build it up, to ensure that it just survived in the dangerous climate of the time. A time that is maybe even more dangerous than the one we find ourselves in right now. I have a feeling that Barnabas was probably an introvert. We don't hear of him being a firebrand like Peter or an outspoken adventurer like Paul. We hear very few words from him. There are no great sermons or exhortations from Barnabas recorded in the scriptures, but we see behind almost every scene his calm and discerning presence, doing nothing spectacular, but always helping the others to clearly say, see the way they should go. Three things we do recognize in Barnabas are his humility, his faith, and his courage. From what we know of him, it seems that Barnabas was not one to push his way to the front, to loudly shout down others, to impose his personal views on anyone, or to claim to have exclusive access to the voice of God. We can sometimes think we and hear our own thoughts as coming from God, when they can simply just be our own ideas, based on our desire for attention. As G.K. Chesterton put it, there is no one more dangerous than he who thinks he knows the will of God. We can endanger the faith of others by our own selfish desire to be heard and believed. That's certainly not what the church needed in Barnabas' time, nor in ours. No, Barnabas wasn't like that. When Paul, Paul admonished him for treating Gentiles wrongly, he simply realized his mistake, carried on with a new mindset. When he realized that the church in Antioch was becoming too large for him to manage himself, he humbly asked for help, went and found Saul. When Paul refused to take John Mark on another missionary trip, Barnabas simply took him along with himself. Recognizing the potential in his young cousin and knowing that he needed the experience but doing all this without jeopardizing his relationship with Paul. He did not lord it over anybody, did not consider himself better than others, and did not think he knew more about God or God's will than others. He was the epitome of humility. As for his faith, we've already read what Luke described him as, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. 
Being full of the Holy Spirit means to be open and obedient to the leading of the Spirit. It's not flashy, it's not over the top, it's not always being up and happy, it's not always thinking we know God's will. It's more about being content in the Spirit, taking the ups and downs of life with calm assurance that God is in control, though we may not always feel like we are. The current pandemic crisis is a great example. So many people are panicking, freaking out even, because something dangerous is coming into their lives that they can't control. Their well-ordered lives are in jeopardy of being destroyed by a microscopic life form known as COVID-19. But as Barbara Brown Taylor tells us, we do not lose control of our lives. What we lose is the illusion that we were ever in control in the first place. Our sense of control in our lives is an illusion. Our lives can change drastically or even end in a split second. We don't really have control of what happens to us. But Barnabas' faith was the faith of a man with a deep and calm trust in his God, knowing that whatever happened to him, he belonged to the Lord God of heaven, that it was God who was in control of his life. His deep faith gave him great courage in uncertain and dangerous situations. He put his life and his reputation on the line by taking Saul to the apostles. After all, though he may have witnessed the changes in Saul, he could have been wrong about him because it was possible and maybe even probable that the old Saul would not have been above using a fake conversion experience to be able to get at and eradicate the very heart of the church in Jerusalem. Maybe Saul was dismissing with their minds. We all know the damage that fake news does today in our society. Barnabas was a man who through his humility, his faith and his courage, dared to believe that Saul's conversion was genuine. In fact, he dared to believe that God would use the man Saul in a mighty way in the church. He dared to believe that an encounter with Jesus Christ could change a man's heart in ways that would turn him from a murderous persecutor of the church to its greatest champion. This was Barnabas, a man who dared, a man who put his life on the line over and over again because he trusted in God. A man who felt so loved by God that he dared to share it with anyone who would listen. A quiet, humble, faithful, and courageous man. A man who dared for God. Perhaps Paul was thinking of Barnabas when he wrote these words to Timothy. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. This is what God calls us quiet, humble, faithful, and courageous. A presence, the presence of God in a world that is crazy with fear. He calls us to dare, to dare for him, especially during a time of crisis, such as we find ourselves in today. He calls us to dare to be his love and calmness in the midst of all the panic and fear. He calls us to dare to forget about our own needs and trusting in him to look to the needs of those who are without or shut in or especially vulnerable at this time. God calls us to dare. As Douglas Cooper put it in his book, Living God's Love. God needs people who would dare to love now. Dare to the love in the face of fear and immense danger. Dare to love Jesus. Dare to love themselves as sons and daughters of God. Dare to love the unlovely. Dare to love their enemies. Dare to love, though it may cost them their lives. This is what God calls us to do. Do we dare? Really, the question should not be, do we dare? The question should be, dare we not? Amen. I thought I'd end from one of my favorite spots here in this town, up on Black Rock. Well, we've done it again. 
We've spent some time in worship. We've spent some time in God's Word. And we've let God's Word spend some time on us. A couple of community things. Obviously, we're not hosting any more uh, serv services or groups in the church. Though we'd love to do more and more online, if you can. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you can sign up for our Facebook group where we're doing some events. We could do some video Bible studies like this. There are some other ones that we could join in on, courses we can join in on over the next couple weeks, few weeks. So we're uh, looking at that. So stay tuned. Now, a couple of you have asked if we can, how we can do our offerings. And you can just drop that off at the church through the mail slot, put it in an unmarked envelope, or you can mail it to us as well. So a couple ways you can do that. We're gonna come around for some social distance visits for those that need that. If you need groceries or meds, we'd love to get that to you. Do one shop safely and then deliver that. So let us know what you need and we can get that for you. Um, I think that, I don't know, there's probably some other important things to say, but it's been nice to gather with you like this. We're gonna end off with a hymn together that we're gonna play on here, and we can sing along A Mighty Fortress. It has a, a new, a modern chorus, so enjoy those words as well. And we'll sing together well, I'll do our closing benediction now. I invite you to open your hands to receive even at this time. May the Lord Jesus who loves us and goes with us wherever we are in whatever situation uphold you, give you his joy and his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate On earth is not his equal Did we in our own strength confide Our striving would be losing Were not the right man the man of God's own choosing Does God's cure that may be Christ Jesus it is He The Lord of hosts His name From age to age the same And He must win the battle Triumph through us The Prince of Darkness
lives are ours through Him who with us sided. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. Hey, Smitty and Joan. Here's our beautiful city. Just coming into the light. Praying for you all. Let us know your prayer requests. And let's continue in this together. Blessings on you.